what, what can we say? Uh, for our non-elected uh, branch of government, right? What can we say? Uh, I was tempted um, on to post something on social media regarding the uh, decisions, the two that came down from the Supreme Court, because I, like a lot of us, you know, had these inner rumblings wow. of, uh, you know, heard setback, setback, and you know, in our lifetimes, yes. we've seen progress made, and then we we've seen the pendulum swing the other way. It's like, when are we going to get off this back and forth, back and forth? And this comes on this week on just about a year, less than a year, I think, from the decision on Roe v. Wade. Right. So it's like these three major turning the tables around. And I thought, uh, as I watched some of the other posts that you know, other people in spiritual communities were sharing on Facebook, how are we as a spiritual community who embodies the Christ principle to respond? Do we, are we silent, are we mute? Do we just put our head in the sand and pretend like this is not our battle and not even think about this? And my first response was, you know, our response is in faith. It's always in faith, most certainly knowing that whatever decision man makes, no matter how harsh or they're only temporal. Right. We know they're only temporal. They're, they're, it seems like an eternity sometimes, but it's but for a moment. Uh, because the spirit of life and liberty within us, um, that is that Christ principle that dwells in us cannot be bound. It cannot be bound by anything that man or woman or anyone else legislates or does. So um, we are aware and we are very cognizant of the limitations of those who dwell amongst us in positions of authority. The scripture tells us we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against it's principalities about against spiritual wickedness yes. in high places. So we, we are well aware that there are people who have limited views, limited ideas of themselves and others who sit in positions of power and authority. People who sit there in very fearful places, feeling like their position in the country and the world is being encroached upon. Those who've invested so much of their life of maintaining a place of superior, superiority, and they're threatened that others may snatch that away. So we're well aware of that. Uh, so faith is always our response. On the other hand, we also must consider that faith without works is what? It's dead. Faith without works is dead. So while we know our victory is assured, we must fight the good fight of faith, meaning we're not silent. We're not silent in the face of these kind of oppressive and uh, commands and dictates and policies and legislation that's coming up from Florida, uh, from that state, from uh, the Supreme Court and other throughout the country. We must lend our voice to this idea that our God is a God of compassion, a God of justice, a God that even says to us, as much as you've done it to the least of these, you've done it unto me. You can't neglect those that are marginalized in the community and think that you're not marginalizing the God of the universe. Because Jesus embodying this say, as much as you looked at those that stood in need and as much as you've oppressed others, you've done it unto me. So every decision that's made is not an indictment against just people of color or the LGBTQI community or marginalized communities. It's an indictment against the very God of the universe. And we know that will not stand, that will not hold. So I, I am both, you know, this week I, I had somewhat ambiguous, uh, you know, ambivalent feelings in the sense that one part of me, you know, wanted to that, <clears throat> the other part of me was just resting the knowledge that this too shall pass. This too shall pass. And we fight on. We live to fight another day. And at some point we will have that more perfect community. We will have that more compassionate community. If we all do our due diligence, don't be silent, keep the faith and fight on. I just wanted to share before we move on, there is a book that I've used in uh, my, um, one of the classes that I've taught over the last couple of years was published in two, 2017, right before the pandemic. It's called The Color of Law. It's the Forgotten history of how our government, I don't know if the camera can pick this up, how our government segregated America. 
And for anyone that is still a little bit at all confused about whether affirmative act, um, action was uh, maybe not sufficient, but yet necessary to try to right the wrongs of this society, read Richard Rothstein's book. Uh, it opens up not just individual prejudices and how African-Americans suffered through slavery, but it talks after slavery how the government of the US put in policies and laws that restricted black folks from owning property, yeah. from getting mortgages, from getting having their mortgages insured by FHA. Even the Veterans Administration would have policies in place that African-Americans that served this country with the uniform on could not receive uh, mortgages to buy a home. This was in, in 1800. This wasn't just 1910, you know, about 1950s and 60s and 70s. We're talking about a generation ago. So when we think about why was affirmative action so needed, it wasn't perfect because the balances of justice, it has to be right. And, and we know anything put in place to help us often is misused, mm -hmm. and that's the risk we take. But I encourage you to read that book. All right, enough of me. I want to get off the bully pulpit. but I just, I just needed to say that. <laughs> I just needed to say that before we, we go on. I'm sure um, uh, Reverend John is going to end his message. I have no doubt he can articulate this far better than I can. So I'm just looking forward to hearing him his sermon and his message on today. So our outline for today is we're gonna open up with a meditation and then the opening prayer. I'm gonna ask Minister Obina and welcome from Nigeria. Uh, it's good to see you. It's always good to see our family from across the sea in the motherland. Thank you for being here. I'm gonna ask after the opening meditation, if you would do the opening prayer for us. Uh, following that, then, um, Sister Bettina, if you would do the opening scripture and then the quote, and then I'll come back. That sounds like a plan, everyone? Sounds good. Everybody's doing okay? I haven't heard your voices. Just unmute and give me a shout out. Everybody's doing okay? Yes. Yeah. yeah I, love, I love hearing your voices. Yeah. Hearing your voices. So as we prepare to meditate and... Um, you know, meditation is John and Brenda's uh, expertise, but I practice meditation myself. It's been a part of my spiritual practice for many years. And it's the one thing that's able to calm me um, without using those other go-to things like food or substance or other kind of erratic behavior mm -hmm. to just kind of center myself and bring myself back to a place of peace. So I always encourage it. But as we prepare to... Uh, go into the meditation today. Uh, we do not, uh, Wes is here, but he is not, uh, uh, doesn't have stable enough Wi-Fi to play for us throughout the service. So I'm going to be using actually Brenda's um, singing bowl. And I want to just mark that as the opening of our meditation. And if we would just bow our heads and put ourselves in a very quiet, uh, restful place, relaxing your shoulders, grounding yourself in the energy of your body, knowing that this is your body temple that is very sacred and it's holy. It's divinely created and uniquely created just for you. You were sent here to occupy this temple in a very special way. And the work you've been called to do, no one else can do but you. So as you rest in that knowledge and just sit in your purpose, I want us to just take a few collective breaths together. And we're gonna breathe in deeply. Inhaling and release. Inhaling and release. Once again, inhale and release. And as we center this meditation and our thought for the today and for this month, a more just society. I want that to just ring through your ears and through your soul and through 
through the cells of your body as the singing bowl did, a more just society. I wanna just share a brief quote with you from a noted uh, theologian and minister it said, one of God's central qualities is compassion. A word that in Hebrew is related to the word womb. Not only is compassion a female image suggesting the source of life and nourishment, but it also has a feeling dimension. God is a compassionate spirit feels for us as a mother feels for the children of her womb. Spirit feels the suffering of the world and participates in it. And as we meditate on that, know that whatever we feel and experience, spirit also is in this struggle with us. Scripture tells us that the whole creation grown is waiting for the redemption of our bodies. So we're not alone. Whatever setback we may experience, whatever disappointment we may experience, know that we're not in this alone. All around us as we observe the pregnant creation, the pregnant potential that we are filled with, the possibility is here, that we can bring forth a more just, compassionate, and loving society. Indeed, as we meditate on this thought, just, just know that perhaps the pains we are feeling are not the pains of trouble, but they are the pains of birth, of birthing, of labor, the struggle to bring forth, the struggle to give birth, to struggle to bring out into the universe that which holds the life that we all desire to be wed to. The spirit of God is arousing us within in this very moment. In this very moment, it, it is quickening our body as the contractions, as we feel the contractions in our body, that those are birthing pain. And let us know to not be discouraged and not be dismayed that we are bringing forth that which is good and just and righteous and loving and compassionate. As the world is changing around us, the earth is giving birth. The universe is giving birth. Let us just rest in that knowledge that as we reframe this moment from a negativity to the pain from being that of sorrow or despair or disappointment to that of contraction. We are bringing forth that which God has created us to do in purpose as we renew and restore this earth. As we come back to center, let's take a few more deep breaths together. Breathing deeply in and releasing. Breathing in, releasing. And one more time together. Let's breathe in and release. Ashe. And on that. Thank you for sharing that meditation with me. We're going to move forward with our opening prayer with Minister Obina, followed by our scripture by Sister Bettina, and I'll quote. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from Nigeria. Good evening, good evening. And happy birthday to you once more, Wes. Thank you for joining. Uh, let us pray. God of surprises, call us from the narrowness of our traditions 
to the new ways of being church, from the captivities of our culture to creative witness for justice. From the smallness of our horizons to the bigness of your vision, clear the way in us, your people, that we might call others to freedom and renewed faith. Clear the way in us, your people, that we might call others to wholeness and integrity. Great Spirit, you call us from fear to faithfulness, from clutter to clarity, from a desire to control to depart trust, from the diffusal to love to a readiness to risk. Clear the way in us, your people, that we might all know the beauty and power and danger of the gospel. Ashe, and amen. Amen. Thank you, Minister, for being all the way from Nigeria. Thank you. We'll have our scripture and then our quote for today. But let judgment run down as waters and run righteousness as a mighty stream. Amos 5.23. What I want to do is get the bottom 98% of us angry as hell about the way the elites are structuring the society in their own narrow self-interest to the determinant of all the rest of us. This society, like most societies in the world, has been structured to serve the self-interest of the wealthy and powerful. If you have a society in which 1% of that population owns 43% of the wealth. It is pretty clear that the 1% has structured the society so it kind of work out the way and they have a tremendous amount of power to sustain it. If you have a system that produces a pretty large and radically impoverished clash, then no matter how fair the rules are enforced and no matter how democratically those rules are made, it is not a just society. Marcus Berg on the prophets of Jesus. Thank you. That's the, the late uh, uh, renowned theologian and minister, Marcus Berg, professor, uh, who uh, in the same uh, school of thought as the late uh, uh, Dr. Howard Thurman envisioned a new, uh, a way of understanding Jesus as an, uh, or Christ or God as his active agent in the world and that our challenge, our responsibility, our purpose is to move us to a more just society. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, we're gonna move forward with our seven life affirming principles. I'm gonna ask Nadia to come forward to read those for us. Priam's seven life affirming principles, community agreements. We affirm that life is in the breath and breath is life. Therefore, we join together to promote our shared humanity and inseparable breath. We affirm that we are born whole, complete as perfect manifestations of the universal mind. We affirm our physical bodies differ and as such may present different challenges, limitations, or privileges that everyone may not share. Therefore, we join together to share our strengths and support one another where they may be weaknesses so that we all may enjoy the fullness of life. We affirm that we agree to pursue peace, walk in truth, and uphold justice tempered with mercy. We affirm that we're like branches on a tree. Although we may grow in different directions, we share a common root, and as such, we pledge to respect each person's fat, even as it may differ from one's own. We agree to walk in agreement that it is all right to disagree, and we protect and safeguard this right in so much as the state of disagreement upholds an affirmation of life. We affirm that community building is the process of communally shared principles, shared resources, as well as equitable access to resources. Therefore, we commit to being agents of an open culture that welcomes everyone to participate in the life of the community with the provision that we also hold each other accountable for acts that do not support the life-affirming principles of our awareness while equally looking for and enacting a commitment to forgive and restore in the spirit of humility and love. Lastly, we affirm the earth and all that dwell therein are manifestations held within the universal mind and humanity's role is to be faithful stewards of this earth by demonstrating respect and dignity for all beings, the sacredness of Mother Earth and our commitment to care for her as we care for ourselves. 
Thank you, Nadia. That's that's our community agreements here at Triumph. No long doctrinal statement, no lot of do's and don'ts. Uh, simply, we agree to live in harmony and peace with one another. That's the gateway into our community. All right, so this is our time uh, for our sacred readings. And today's sacred readings are, are a little different from the ones that we normally share. Usually we try to share readings um, that are very inspiring and you know, kind of lifting you up and thinking on a more positive plane. But I thought it would be it would be interesting today, given that there's so much happened this past week. And as we move into the second part of the, the year, to maybe try to, to put our finger on the pulse of how a lot of people are feeling, mm -hmm. uh, how their, their hearts are really beating or, or the rhythm that really have them in this place of anxiety and, and despair. And so we want to just share these all about society, uh, not to put people in a blue state of mind, but just to say that around us, there are people that may not be feeling as happy and upbeat as we are. They may not just come off of a cruise uh, you know, from, uh, uh, from, you know, whatever. from wherever, you know, or been on a nice long vacation and they may just be feeling stuck mm -hmm. at a place where it's like quicksand. The more you try to get out, the deeper uh, you fall into the pit. So um, I'm going to, you know, try doing the, the uh, to substitute for the music. I'm going to, at the beginning of each reading, I'll strike the uh, singing bowl. Um, and then after the reading is concluded, we'll pause a moment. After I strike the singing bowl again, then we'll pick up the next one. So Bettina, guide us. How do you want us to go through these? I'll go through all of them. Okay, oh, so okay. Bettina, then it'll just be you and I. I'll, I'll start off by, I'll, I'll try to strike to begin three times and I'll end three times and between each one, I'll strike it once, all right? May you be blessed by these, feel the energy, uh, feel the spirit in these, feel the heartache, the despair. Um, as we as a spiritual community, our goal is to be the salt, as I shared last week, that sprinkles a little bit of ourselves in just the right amount to help bring out the best uh, in folks. All right. Welcome to society. We hope you enjoy your stay. And please feel free to be yourself, as long as it's in the right way. Make sure you love your body, not too much, or we'll tear you down. We'll bully you for smiling, and then wonder why you frown. We'll tell you that you're worthless, that you shouldn't make a sound, and then cry with all the others as you're buried in the ground. You can fall in love with anyone, as long as, as, long as it's who we choose. And we'll let you have your opinions, but please shape them into our views. Welcome to society. We promise that we won't de deceive. And one more rule, now that you're here, there's no way you can leave by E.H. Society, from the moment you were born, you were told what to do. Be anything you want as long as you're never you. They've paid your path and gave you rules, keep you on walking straight because dreaming is for fools. You were told of all forbidding land where dreams to go to die. They said never to go there, but shouldn't even try. But those who go there have seen things far and wide, walked away from their chosen path, and became their own God. And if you ever dare, give one of them your time. They'll tell you about the dangers and the mountains you'll, you'll climb. But after all the dangers and the hardships are gone, you'll find the truth about the path and find that everyone else is wrong. There really only is one path for you. No one else has the same path. And, you've, and you're the only one who can choose, Nadia. <laughs> wake up and conform this world we live in now makes me feel fake as I try to match what's presented as the right kind of girl 
Flawless ivory skin, dazzling smiles, perfect bodies, all presented by modern media. As a requisite for being wanted for being considered beautiful. In reality, beneath these illusions, beauty shines in every life, every smile, every body. Matching these unspoken rules will always make you unhappy because conformity all allows no room for originality. God made each person beautiful because he made each person on this earth uniquely perfect. You are beautiful, flawless, wanted. There is no one perfect type of person. You are you and that's the most beautiful being you could be by Mia Rose. <laughs> to society, to blame society, yet we fail to realize that each and every one of us makes up society. Everyone should realize that we are each living, breathing human beings, all with our own struggles. We all go home and stare at the mirror wishing we could be something different. We all struggle to find our place in this world, and we all have our own struggles. So why go out of your day to make someone else's worse when you can simply move on with your life or even better help someone else out for a change? Because you see, if you live in a world where everyone blames society, you might as well blame yourself because you are a part of society too. By Julia Martinez. <laughs> you, Christina. Thank you for sharing those. We're going to take maybe two quick minutes. Um, if anyone wants to comment on either of the readings, the first one was Welcome to Society. The second one was Society by Nadia, but not our Nadia. Uh, the third one was Wake Up and Conform by Mia Rose. And the third one was To Society by Julia Martinez. Anyone want to quickly say something before we move on? I want to make sure we have enough time for Reverend John. Um, oh, Minister Bean, I see your, your hand is raised. Just unmute and go ahead. Okay, uh, I want to speak on the on welcome to society. The, the, the right up. And the other, other ones are uh, all about our society and uh, how it forms us into a mold. In life, the greatest struggles are what motivates people the most. And uh, despite the violence and discrimination one faces, he or she will still be able to find a moment of understanding within his uh, or her life. That is to say, no matter the hardships people face, people can still succeed. She reveals the qualities of sensible and compassionate leader should imbibe. And on a general outlook and the things to look for in a leader in the society. It also recommends that the leader should build a just society and a strong relationship with the led. And in order to lead, he should be ready to serve his followers. And truly, society can be too quick to judge some people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Bean. I appreciate that, your, your comments. Um, if there's another, not, we will not belabor. Uh, we thank you again for sharing and may these readings uh, speak to you throughout the week. All right, we're going to prepare to uh, hear our feature speaker today. Uh, Reverend Am Prakash, Reverend Dr. John Gilmore on the subject of Independence Day. This week is the holiday, 4th of July on Tuesday. And so this is appropriate. Um, just a bit about what we can expect from his sermon. Um, there was a movie called Independence Day. In it, violent, hateful aliens came to earth and tried to take over. The president of the US who had been a fighter pilot with the help of Will Smith and all the other nations led a battle against the aliens and drove them off. The world came together as one to conquer the alien invasion. 
Would this really happen if there was an alien invasion? Hmm. What happened when there was a pandemic? We will explore human behavior in times of stress and the damage that is often caused by the nat by not by nature or the devil, but by the human being. What is inside the human being themselves and what is necessary to be free of the fears, anger, ignorance that often besets the human being in times of stress. It is with great pleasure and my honor to introduce to you um, Am Prakash Reverend Dr. John Gilmore, who really needs no introduction. His resume is lengthy. Uh, his service is uh, unquestioned and his compassion um, to live out that life of making a more just society is real. So we just welcome to this platform, um, Reverend Dr. John Gilmore. Hello, everybody. And Nadia, if you could, if I could just ask you to pin uh, spotlight Dr. John for us. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Unfortunately, this isn't going to be a um, very patriotic sermon, um, but it expresses some hope, I think. Um, I was inspired on the train from a general assembly I went to this last week in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. This year we rode along rails past factories, farmhouses, the backyards of Pennsylvania, all across small streets with flashing red lights. And I saw a lot of towns that I have never heard of in Pennsylvania. They look very quiet and very peaceful. Um, they look like places I'd wanna live in, but deep inside in my heart, I knew that I could not live in them. I thought of how unwelcome I would be in small towns in central Pennsylvania, the place we often call the Mississippi of the North mm -hmm. because of just how they were. I was destined, you see, to live in a city, destined to live in urban centers for safety's sake because of the color of my skin and the prejudices that would most likely be projected on me because of all the projections that are cast onto people like me regardless of who I am, where I was born and the things I liked or my personality. I would likely be non-accepted and maybe even tortured because of a vast minority of people whose deplorable behavior would go unchecked and that often goes unchecked in the United States. And that is the shame of living in the United States now and in many of the colonized countries. There's a celebration of freedom, of justice, of the ability to work one's way up in order to be the best that one can. But somewhere along the way, some of us were excluded from that issue and that option. And so I watch with a bag of popcorn in my hand as my train passes through small towns that I would love to live in, but would most likely not be accepted in. And this too, of course, is drawing on stereotypes about people in small towns, but also on the history and on past events in my lifetime and in the lifetime of most African-Americans that are real and have happened over and over again. The feeling of that, feeling of that train ride and looking out the window was very different from what I saw on the movie Independence Day. I wrapped, I watched in rapt attention a long time ago. Um, many of you might remember it. It goes something like this. Extraterrestrials came to Earth. They wanted to take over. They parked their ships over every capital and began to obliterate people. Everybody was panicking, going crazy. People were being shot dead in the streets. There were all kinds of explosives and explosions, but Will Smith's character wasn't like anyone else, nor was the first lady. She was in the street with the Will Smith character's wife, feeding the homeless, helping those who were suffering. And the president who had been a fighter pilot went out before everyone when they discovered a weapon that they could use against these extraterrestrials. He 
along with Will Smith, not only went out to fight against the extraterrestrials, but led an international group against them, turned them back. Everyone pulled together because there was an outside cause. They all worked together to save the world as one people, as one world. As I watched this, I wondered what would have really happened. Later when COVID hit, I began to see that humans didn't pull together when they were hit by something that would be devastating. People couldn't even buy toilet paper for a couple of weeks in the Philadelphia area. In Philadelphia, someone had bought up most of the toilet paper, paper towels, and sanitizers that they believed that we needed to use to save our lives at the time and was selling them for an unreasonable price on the internet. One of the governors in Maryland had to get his Korean wife to buy masks for him from outside the country and smuggle them in so they wouldn't be stolen. And various shipments of masks going to so-called liberal cities like Boston were in fact stolen. I saw the same behavior I had experienced throughout my life on steroids. Instead of moving higher and to higher ground, they became selfish. They began to clump together. They began to go backwards instead of forward and sink into all of the old prejudices and ways of discriminating that were prevalent in the past. It was almost like the process of extinction we run into when we think about behavior modification. This process can be seen when one has conditioned an animal. If you give a pigeon a pellet every time he hits the lever, it is happy and it keeps hitting the lever more and more. But if you stop giving it the, the pellet or the reinforcement at its call, it hits the lever and doesn't get anything. When it doesn't get anything, it gets agitated and hits the lever harder and harder with more frequency, hoping to get that same positive reinforcement that it had gotten earlier. It stops hitting the lever after a long period of time, but every so often, most of its life, it will go and hit that lever a few times looking for the same type of reinforcement it had in the past. I call the collective behavior modification that a large portion of people in the United States have, and they have partaken of it, and they are still affected by it and I call it MAGA. Make America great again mm -hmm. by trying to go back to an imaginary time of feeling safe and secure, pushing for control, pushing for disempowerment of women, pushing for discriminatory practices of people of color, pushing to destroy labor unions and the welfare state, putting immigrants and their children in cages, building walls along the border, pushing to go backwards whenever a tragedy comes upon us instead of joining together and overcoming it by pushing forward. And that is the tendency of a large group of people in our nation. And it's very frightening. On the original Independence Day, people were still buying and selling enslaved people. Native Americans were understood to be wild animals and savages without souls. Women were just there to take care of the men and have children. Many people were thrown under the bus in order to create a union so that those who were the leaders and people like them could prosper and survive. And so that all people could possibly be free in the future. Some didn't want to make the agreement, but some did not only to save themselves, but for their own benefit, hoping that many people, the enslaved people would never be free. Now this changed for a while. We have grown as a people, but there are some people who haven't changed and they hold on to the same beliefs as way back then. The question is, what can we who believe in freedom do about it? What can those who believe in the living gospel of liberation do about it? I really don't have an answer for this, but I do have some suggestions. Um, I think the first thing to do is for all of us to remember who we really are. We are not solely a race. The concept of race was invented in the 1600s 
in the United States. I think most people don't really even know about that. Until then, people went by their nationalities. We're not solely male, female, or transgender. We are not solely citizens of one country or the next. We are much greater. Some would call us the creative energy of the universe wrapped in human flesh. The apostle Paul described us as the worship of ages contained in earthen vessels. Jesus talked about us as the light of the world or the city of God or the dwelling place of what we call God. Because of our creative nature, we are able to look at the world and to think clearly. We're able to dream great dreams. And if we work together to make those dreams come true, that is the human niche on this planet. That is our gift. That is what many of us have sold for a bowl of beans. As long as we cling to the other labels and think that our egos or conditioned selves are all that we are, we are trapped in an artificial system designed to make us use our creative energy to support a system where 1% of the people own 90% of the resources and 99% of the people are fighting over 10%. Mm -hmm. Our energy is being wasted. We are being used to enslave ourselves and our neighbors and to create a world that's almost unbearable, unbearable even for our own children. Child suicide rates are going up. Drugs uses is going up because people cannot stand the society that we have created in this nation. And this must stop. Secondly, it's necessary to reclaim our abilities to think. And when I say think, I am not only talking about logic and the so-called rational mind. I'm talking about what Qigong philosophy and the leading, latest findings of science, is, of science talk about. They say we're very complex beings and they say that we have more than 200 trillion cells all working together and all coordinated to make the whole work. Aside from this, there is even more biomatter in our guts and a cloud of germs and other living organisms living around and within our body in harmony. Somehow, in some way, all these things are communicating with each other. Scientists are baffled by this and they think the only way this communication can be happening so fast is because these cells are communicating at the speed of light. Some physicists have even conjectured that this is because we are light or part of one thing. As almost every spirituality teaches us as us being part of the spoken word of God teaches us as one being in a body of Christ teaches us. The object of Qigong is to connect the brain, which is the central nervous system, to the whole body through the peripheral nervous system so we can begin to understand the feelings that we are receiving from the whole body. And as we begin to understand our feelings and understand them as messages and learn to translate what we are picking up from the environment, we wake up or become woke as the People who are asleep hate to hear. The whole body becomes like a brain with every cell, all the biomatter, and with every germ communicating and interacting with the environment, the body is doing the perceiving and the brain becomes the instrument that interprets what's being picked up without the prejudice or bias that happens when people claim that they are just being rational we in turn become almost like superhuman beings. Our thinking includes thoughts, feelings, and intuition, and yet instead of just sitting there and trying to use logical syllogism. Yes, we still make if-then statements, but we're able to skip some of the steps. It becomes like a child who goes from crawling to walking. One can walk just about anywhere. One could be finished there. But when one can run or jump, it's altogether different. Our minds become faster so they can move with ease. They can jump from one place to the next without having to go step by step. And this is the ultimate nature of the mature human mind. This is what they call being enlightened. This is what is quoted 
in the Bible where Jesus says, these things ye shall do, and ye shall do more. This is transcending the form, the human limitation that we have been given by a society that wants to shape us in order to use us to the best of its ability. Lastly, we will prosper if we stop arguing as to whether there is a God or not. Mm -hmm. I think that's the biggest waste of time in the world. Mm -hmm. There is no absolute proof that there is, and there is no absolute true proof that there isn't. And there is proof that there is, and there is proof that there isn't. There are so many definitions of God also that one cannot prove or disprove the existence of God or goddess or consciousness or love or the many adjectives that we use to try to describe what is beyond our understanding. We don't know for sure until our body is dead, there is an element of faith involved. And then even if we die and come back and say there is one, most people will not believe it's us anyway and think that it's something they just ate that night and had a weird dream. The truth is that we are talking about archetypes if there be a God or not, our understanding of it is something that comes from our own filter in our own heads. We're talking about stories, images, thoughts, and projections that take place deep in our collective conscious and subconscious that help us make sense of the world in which we live. I went to India one year on a pilgrimage to an ashram that combined Christianity with Hinduism. I was studying something called Nada Yoga, or the Yoga of Sound, which involved a lot of chanting. At the time I discovered, which surprised me, that all of the gods and the goddesses people were worshiping were like archetypes. They were the parts of one's own psyche that one had to come to terms with. One was drawn to the god or goddess that corresponded to the subconscious part of the self that one had to work with to heal oneself. It was as if they developed a sort of Jungian psychology before there was such a thing in the West in order to heal themselves and the society psychologically back when religion and science were combined. There were those who actually believed there were these big beings walking around, of course, but you often run into people like that everywhere. I would say the same is about deities now, what one is attracted to or what one perceives as one says more about the person than the God, goddess, or whatever one upholds or doesn't uphold as the center of one's universe. That's why it's still necessary to look closely and examine what it is. And it doesn't make one, a, if it doesn't make one a good person, the person one wants to be, one has to either change what they are believing or change oneself. Ralph Burrow, a Unitarian Universalist professor at the University of Chicago, once wrote a book called Toward a Scientific Theology. It's very interesting to consider his thinking because Ralph Burrow was a Jewish atheist. Now, when we hear about atheists, we say, oh, they don't believe in God. They have nothing to say, but there are some people who are atheists who believe in God, which might be shocking. Ralph Burrow thought of God as the power behind the process of evolution and extinction. He basically said that the groups of people who could stay together and create healing, nurturing societies would prosper, while those who couldn't would eventually end up in a state of extinction. He understood this as the blessing of God or not. He warned that as we grew in awareness and power, we, the people of the world, would have to move beyond placing our major emphasis on the phenotype or our physical characteristic and the culture type or the norms of whatever group we were in. But we would have to focus on the ecotype, realizing that we are part of a large e ecosystem that we would have to nurture and care for first or all human beings might become extinct, the place where we are right now. Religion for him was upholding an ideal that human beings were supposed to evolve toward until they transcended the limitations of fear, ignorance, prejudice, 
and lack of self-love and love for others. The problem is, however, that most of the religion, the belief system that were created to lift us up, to realize that we were part of something greater, part of the all in all, have fallen into the same trap of narrowness and ignorance. They were created to dissolve. They are trapped in culture types as they believe they are the only right ones because their culture is the best. And now they, they're going backwards into the phenotypes as they are talking about different races being better and more powerful than the others. So instead of moving us ahead and making us evolve into something greater, they seem to be pulling us backwards. What can we do to change this? What can we do to change the world? What can we do to make it better? Reclaim the power that we have as human beings. Reclaim our power to think clearly and use head and heart to know the truth. And lastly, reclaim our power to connect directly with that which we perceive as the ground of being, the source of life, God by any name, realizing that people according to their cultures and nationalities, ages and language and experience may be calling what we're talking about by another name. It's only natural that this should happen. Even if we talk about a fast car, every language has a different word for car, but they're all talking about the same thing. Why would we think that every language would speak about God the exact same way? When we have made that jump, when we realize that the only power that words and names have are the ones that we give to them, we will be free. We will be independent. Independence Day will come because we will not be dependent on some charismatic individual to come down from on high to save our communities and save the world. We will realize that it is all in our hands and all work together to create a world that would not only nurture ourselves or only our children, but our children's children and every living being. I think that in the Christian Bible, Jesus said it is finished because it's time to stop waiting for a savior. And it's time to use the power we have been given to save ourselves and the rest of humanity. The word for save in Greek scripture comes from salvus or to heal, to make whole. Let us be dedicated to doing that. And from that very moment, we will be free and fulfill our own destiny as human beings and children of God. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend John. Uh, Tanya, if you could remove the spotlight. Uh, thank you so much. As always, you just uh, drop so much on us in such a very powerful way. Um, I'm going to just open up for any comments, or questions, feedback, any thoughts that uh, come up for anyone. Just go unmute and go ahead. Uh, good morning. Good morning. I, I just feel always blessed to hear Mr. John talking, and I feel very embraced by the community that people are, have the same concerns, and we are wor worried about all the issues in the world. So I feel very uh, glad to be part of this community to have found this and these questions that we might not have answers for all of them, but we do have the questions and. When we do not question them, there is a problem. And I really appreciate it, John. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think, well, thank you for sharing that, Wes. I think sometimes we, we feel inadequate if we don't have the answers. But I think the more powerful part is to frame the question. Because the question then opens up the possibility for the answer to come. Jesus said, seek and ye shall find. You have to begin to look and inquire. If 
you think you know the answer, there's no place to go with it. But when you can say, you know, I'm not necessarily don't have all the answers, but I have some questions. And so I appreciate that. Anyone else? Yeah, I think that part of the problem with our system is it, it shapes what questions you ask. And that they've become so sophisticated that they, they don't shape your answer. They they actually come to the point where they can shape what questions you ask. And that way they can prevent your freedom all the time and make people who have the right questions afraid to even mention it. You know? Pretty satanic, actually. That, that, is, that is so key, uh, Reverend John, um, that the power in the question um, that many people don't understand, I, I uh, raised my children, I've taught my, my kids and even my grandchildren, the one who, who asked the question really controls the conversation because you're guiding where you want people to go. Mm -hmm. And and as you said, if you if you're not if you're not um, uh, astute enough or in tune enough to recognize the assumptions that can be embedded in the question, which forces you into a certain place, mm -hmm. and instead of following someone else's question, unpack that and frame your own question, take back control of the conversation instead of chasing someone else's question, because they're always loaded with assumptions or beliefs that are embedded mm. in that question. And you can find yourself running and chasing behind something where someone wants you to go. So that, that is very key in our society. We know that that's what happens. There's this whole debate we see politically. You know, we can turn on from one station to the, to the other and they're, they're back and forth at each other. And really they're all in the same barrel, I think. Mm -hmm. Really, they're all swimming in the same shark infested ocean and want us to jump in there with them. <laughs> right? Yeah. Instead of us looking for another freshwater stream. Get out of there. Don't follow that. Hmm. You know, and they're what, not taking us where we want to go. Yeah, one of the problems with the people who claim that, well, we're just logical and we're just rational is they are, are um, the ones who decide what the premises are. They decide what you can use in order to, 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 to discern the truth. And then you're using what they've created. So you're putting yourself in another box, you know, um, and you're always in their box because they're the ones who are deciding what parts of the little logical syllogism there is. So they're in total control all the time. But there is something called intuition and spiritual knowledge that comes um, but that is not a step-by-step -step process. It's sort of like re revelation, it comes to you. Science will have you break down everything step-by-step -step so they can either try to steal it or co-opt it or use it over again because they're not creative themselves. Um, but the human being that is really developed mentally, physically, and spiritually has these sort of revelations and these awakenings where things just pop out without going step by step by step. And usually the so-called rational people ignore them, whether it's the truth or not, um, and try to make them do this step by step process, which is what we're finding a lot in physics now and in science, where people are, are going these old spiritual concepts five and six thousand years old and saying they've discovered them because they can they can put a formula a mathematical formula to them say discovered what people got from god straight from god two three four thousand years ago and that's happening more and more nowadays wow anyone else anyone else before we uh before we segue reverend john you're going to come back um before we, as we close with final uh, final remarks, and I'm gonna ask you, we're gonna forego our usual closing prayer, ask you to just do the closing prayer for us. And, and if you, as, as you think about, you know, for your closing remarks, um, you know, what would your response to be to a spiritual community in light of what's happening uh, in our world governmentally and the discontent that so many people across the board feel uh, I know with the, with the uh, foregoing the student loan forgiveness really hit a lot of people, black and white and brown and middle-class, not so much the poor, the poor, because a lot of them 
got their, their education paid for, but those who were working um, and struggling now after going to college, doing two and three jobs, you know, Uber and, and all those other things, just, just to try to keep their heads above water. So a lot of people were crushed with that. Uh, and then that on the heels of affirmative actions. How, how are we to hold ourselves in a space, in a place where we're to bring the thoughts, the feelings, the intuition together, as you shared, to uh, move us up um, to that higher way, that place of awakening and being woke. Uh, so just, just if you would just in any way, how you want to respond to that as you come back with the final uh, remarks in our closing prayer. So Bettina is going to come now. Again, thank you, Reverend John. Bettina is going to come now and just kind of bring us back to center with our affirmations for creating a more just society. Affirmations for creating a more, a more society. I have the power to make a difference in someone's life. I am responsible and conscious member of a collective. I choose to live substantially and protect the environment. Environment, sorry. I am a source of inspiration and encouragement. I am strong. I am a strong advocate for justice and equality. I am a leader in my community. I am kind and compassionate towards all beings. I am committed to making the world a more peaceful place. I am reasonable. I'm sorry. I'm responsible and trustworthy global citizen. I am a champion of diversity and embrace differences. I make space for all. I am dedicated to leaving the world a better place that, than I found it. I am proactive in addressing the challenges facing the world. I take action to help others. I am a positive force for good in the world. Ashe and amen. Ashe. Yeah, and that should be affirmations for creating a more just society. That's a typo there. So for a more just society, let's take these with us throughout the week. All right, we're gonna share our announcements. Um, Nadia, if you can just bring those, if you can share those on the screen, we want to talk about um, music ministry. Uh, programs and upcoming events. Just go back a second. Um, our fundraising campaign and then volunteer opportunities. And so, uh, yeah, if you would just bring those up and I'll try to go through them. So our biannual fundraising campaign, we have two weeks left. We open June 15th. Um, and we this is something new that uh, first time trying this. Uh, rather than doing the, uh, the regular kind of quote unquote church way of uh, raising money, and we know that's shifting, that's changing. Uh, we have decided from a board perspective to do twice a year, um, a one month fundraising campaign, June 15th to July 15th and December 15th to January 15th to make up that uh, shortfall in our budget that is not, uh, that's there where we don't have the funds from other resources. So we're two weeks in and we thank everyone that's participated. Each of us have asked to, uh, uh, commit to raising a certain amount. And thank you everyone that's moving forward with that. We've been advertising on social media and um, just by word of mouth to family and friends. Uh, but the, this particular campaign will support funding uh, specifically for the areas and programs that you see on the screen. So our community vegetable garden, we uh, got, received some grant funding for that and we're trying to supplement that so we can just uh, grow that uh, to really be something wonderful in this community. Uh, beautification projects where we're, we're looking to paint the mural and then just really aesthetically make this corner something that feels energetic and alive for the community. Our youth engagement and internship program, we're looking to develop a, uh, a youth mentoring program for our little ones and for our teens, uh, our community lunch program, our meditation and lunch on Fridays, our holistic health and wellness, which engages our Tai Chi um, and our uh, community Bible study, our divine uh, feminine study group, all those things that help to grow us uh, both as, as Dr. John talked about, uh, intellectually, spiritually, uh, intuitively, and in every way. And then crime reduction by fostering goodwill and building trust in cooperation and community. I think when we're connected to people, 
uh, when we feel that, when people feel like you belong and they belong in the community into something, it helps them feel better about themselves. It helps them feel more worthy. And when we have rela build relationships, that's like building bridges. That's a way where we can speak into people. We can be the salt shaker. We can be the light to help people um, be their best. And that's what we're looking to do. So for those that are watching now or later, you are able to scan the QR code on your screen. And I just got introduced to this recently. So I'm coming into this. <laughs> I'm really coming to the new age of technology. Like, how do you do that? I was like trying to do it a week ago. I'm like all over the place. And the young lady had to tell me, no, you push that thing right there. So I figured it out. But you got the QR. For those of you that know, you scan that QR code and everything comes up uh, where you can securely go in and make a donation. Um, right to our website and it will add into our what we're trying to do. There's the old fashioned way to cash out a dollar sign 2020, but the technology, I mean, I'd like to just go to that new place. Yeah, so uh, try it. And now you can go to the next one. Volunteers, uh, we are recruiting volunteers specifically for our uh, new center here. And I'm so thankful for Brother Venice, it's the Julie that are here who are supporting us for our Friday meditation and lunch. They've already started working with us and, and just bless them for giving of their time and service to the community. Um, we, are, we will be holding a volunteer recruitment day. Uh, I have lots of folks that are asking and saying what they you know, would like to do. We're just trying to put it together so we can match people, right. their gifts and their talents and their skills with where we need them to serve. So if you're interested, you can email us at triumphalifecenter at gmail.com. Call me at 862-849-9562. Um, you can go to our website, triumphthechurchofthenewage.org-international, and you should be able to download the volunteer application and send it in right there. So uh, whatever you know, whatever skills you have or don't have, there's a, there's a space and a place for you here at Triumph. Uh, so, uh, just come and find out more about how you can serve. Go ahead, Nadia. And even if you don't live in the local area, most of our ministry team, all of our ministry team are all over. Wes is in California, Brenda's in Boston, Nadia and, and Bettina are in Brooklyn. I'm in New Jersey, so we're all over the place. So even if you're not local, uh, Minister Obina is in Nigeria, uh, Reverend John is in Pennsylvania. Even if you're not local, you can still find a space and place where you can serve in this community. So don't let that deter you. If you're local, you can be on hands and right here on site. But if not, we can still find a way where you can serve and support what we do. All right, Triumph Life Center's music ministry. We released our latest single, which is just really awesome. Sunshine City this past Father's Day. Um, we have a new one coming up. We don't know when that release date is going to be. We're still working on that. And this will be, I think, what's our, our last one for a while. It'll be our 12th one. Um, and then we're going to do some uh, other marketing things with this. But our music ministry, uh, which Wesley is our creative arts and music director, um, this past year has just been awesome. We uh, released our first single last August, and we've released one every month since, plus a special one for Christmas that we did. But the music is original lyrics, original music, um, produced. Uh, Wesley is the brains behind it. And uh, all of the music just speaks to our community's mission and vision and goal and lifting up our communities globally and locally. And so I in, encourage you, you can go to uh, Triumph Life Center and you can find all of our music there. You can also find it on um, Spotify, iTunes, uh, Apple Music, and whatever other digital platforms. I'm just learning all of that too. I, I have an Apple playlist that I've had for a while and I got to remember how, how to do that sometime. But I was introduced through this, through Spotify and iTunes, and you know, other places where, you know, we, they don't buy records like we used to. They don't even know what that is. Or, or CDs like we used to. You just download the music and it's right there. 
So um, Nadia, if you could just go through, this is our latest one. The one before that we uh, released on Mother's Day, Forces of Nature. It's really a spiral dance and movement song. It's really just wonderful. Uh, let's just see the others. Uh, these are our two latest ones. And these are the ones that we've produced over the last year. Um, Sarah Labriza, this is the meditation tune. Together we stand. I'm going to try to play that as we end today. Just be me. Um, and the winds are changing. Oh, I love that one. I, I love all of them. The flow of life. Uh, be all right. Be okay. Uh, search for the sun and seekers. Just beautiful music. Um, different artists that uh, worked with some of them uh, we've had here as a guest. Um, I talked about the process of singing or co-writing and, and working with Wes and producing the music. But if you're looking for something positive to motivate you, to just bring your, your spirit and your mind and your heart all into harmony, check out our music. Wes, anything you want to say about the music before I, I go on? Well, thanks for the support always. I'm excited to... to... To, to you know have you guys support in this message so i'm just happy the the new single i am home uh now we are going to, uh, to a different direction since we completed one year uh just music and music for a month new music i'm very happy with this i think we have a beautiful message to be shared right now to the world and we're gonna try to get that that to reach to more people right so that's our goal we are trying to find strategies we don't want to just for us to be like listening to that music we want that music to move other people and and that's the strategy right now getting getting this music out and that's what i'm going to be working on it and we have the last single that it's not it's i'm going to find the uh, uh the best date for any strategy for for us to get that, that word out. So I have a few songs like our the forces of nature. So far, it's our strongest song. The forces uh, of nature. From all of the ones we wow. have, it's very wow. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's very strong in Brazil. That song, for some reason, it's being added for different playlists. I don't know if you know about playlists, but people add these songs to their playlists. And uh, our the forces of nature were already added for some different playlists of people that from different kind of religions like mm -hmm. ayahuasca people yoga people so i am very happy to Wonderful. have this this song out so that's the strategy that i wanna mm -hmm. gonna go for find the right date for us to be united and all people can hear this message and our message go to the world so keep just be with us <laughs> trust yeah. uh just the process <laughs> that's, that's awesome, Wesley. We we have a, a wonderful following in Brazil, um, and uh, I just appreciate uh, them, just those that follow us and watch us each Sunday, but that our music is taking root there. And sometimes you grow other places before you grow at home. So um, this this is just awesome. It's just awesome to hear. And the Forces of Nature is a song, I think, that, that is so deeply spiritual that it's not about a particular religion or a religious me, a tone, but it, it's that spiritual force. I, I just love it. Add it to your playlist, folks. Oh, okay. Um, Minister Bina, we got to get it growing in, in Nigeria. You know, we, we have to have, you know, you to help us share it there so folks can add it to their playlist there. And eventually we'll, we'll, be, get, we'll be able to record uh, the artists there that's a part of our ministry in Nigeria uh, and produce some music with them. All right, what's next, Nadia? We, we're out of time. Oh, Friday, we'll be back this Friday for our contemplative prayer and meditation and our bag lunch from 12 to 12.30 this week. I was so excited. We had eight folks that came in and was here wow. for meditation. Yeah, I and so it was like, yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. Because we, I, and, I, and I said as we were closing out the meditation, uh, the spirit just dropped this in me and it said, if you feed your soul on a regular basis, you'll never go hungry in your body. And sometimes we put feeding our bodies first, but if we feed our soul regularly, not just sporadically, as a habit, we'll never go hungry. So uh, I look forward to Friday here, um, 12 o'clock to 1230. What's next? I think our... Uh, 
I'll be back this Tuesday is uh, the 4th of July. So we will not have the Divine Feminine Study Group this week or our Bible study. We'll be back next week. That's the 11th here from two to three. And then I think the next one, Nadia, is our Bible study, community Bible study with Pastor Floyd. We'll be back also next week, Tuesday. Um, not this week, the following week. And then Tai Chi, Shaka was off for two weeks. We're going to be back on the 12th. Not this Wednesday, the following Wednesday. I'll post on our social media page. We'll be back. And uh, we're looking forward to, uh, in the fall, doing Tai Chi for children. I've always oh. started talking to some of the children and parents in the neighborhood. So we're looking forward to that. All right. Any, anything else? Um, did I get through everything? Y'all know I'm long-winded. Was, was that the last announcement, Nadia? Yeah, I went through the fundraising. Yeah, so um, for Tina, we're going to, if all minds are clear, we will have our uh, words to live by. Reverend John will come back with his final words, and then he'll give us a closing prayer. I want to just thank everyone that's here. I thought I saw, um, did I see Shaka in the Zoom room? I think I did. I don't know if he's still there. Just a shout out. He had a birthday this past week. So shout out uh, to Shaka. He's away out of state uh, vacation, but thank you. Thank you for joining if he's still there. Um, I also wanted to, last week, I forgot to mention that Pastor Eric Andrews had a birthday. I own Pastor Andrews. So uh, shout out to him. Belated happy birthday to Pastor Eric Andrews um, for another movement around the sun. And may God bless each of you, Wesley, and all those that had birthdays this past week. And bless you abundantly in this right. coming year. All right, that's it. We love you all. Thank you. Thank you, Julie and Ben. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for being here. Uh, God bless you. I love you. Love you much um, to our team and to those watching by social media. I'm going to yield uh, to Bettina, who will give us the words to live by. And then Reverend John will come back with the final words and the closing prayer. A just society is not one built on fear or repression or reverence or exclusion, but one built on love. Love for our families, love for our neighbors, love for the least amongst us, love for those who look different or worship differently, love for those we don't even know. John Legend. You can take that down. Reverend John's going to do, have closing remarks and do the final prayer, his own prayer for us. Okay, there is um, there's an old saying that alchemists have. They say, um, in order to heal or cure a system, you have to look through the dung or what the system throws out in order to find what will heal the system because basically the system throws out what would change it. Um, my advice for us today is in order for us to heal ourselves and the system, we have to reclaim everything that the system is throwing out. We have to look through history and to understand that most religions were started as mystical religions, that the word mystic had become something bad when it actually meant that the person was accepting the fact that there was really a God that they were not separate, but part of this God. And the idea was to transcend our humanity and to become one with the God in thought and in action and deed, as is written about being in the body of Christ, meaning part of Christ. But all of this has been thrown out by the system. So one of the main things that we need to do is to really have trust in what we call God knowing that we, if we follow our belief system, are going to be led into places that we never thought possible. <laughs> um, things that um, have been thrown out are going to be coming up in our minds, in our thoughts, in our dreams, and in our prayers. And we have to accept the fact that the divine is working with us and guiding us and leading us to truth and justice and growth. So the main thing is to have trust, to know who we are. And if we do that, we will naturally overcome all of the barriers and we'll shift this system. 
the group I was with in India, they were um, from a mystic tradition because they were a monastery. A lot of the monasteries had Christian monasteries. Every monastery held onto the mystical tradition, basically. And there was this chant they used to do. And I'd like to do that as a closing. Um, and what happened when you chant, I'll speed this up a little bit. What happens when you chant using certain words is that um, you have a vibration that takes place in the brain and where you have the hypothalamus underneath the brain, what happens is it stimulates your pituitary gland, which sends hormones all through your body that relaxes your body. It also causes your body to be healthy. So when you're chanting, you're actually working your body and you're balancing the energy and you're balancing all the chemicals and things in your body and making yourself more healthy, basically. And the idea is you chant until there's silence and then you just sit in that silence in the awareness that comes. And then if your mind starts racing again, you just chant again. And then when it gets quiet, you sit in that silence. And after a while, you come in contact with or hear the voice of God. That is a very mystical practice that everyone used to do before the people with the swords and clubs took over most of the religious institutions. So um, I'd like to lead us into this chant. This chant goes, um, Om meaning the undifferentiated energy that has created and is beyond all the universe, which would be sort of like the spirit, the Holy Spirit, I guess. Um, the second part is clean, which is sort of this um, word that is a pure connection with the God of compassion, the God of the heart. And they use the word Christaya, which means to Christ. Om clean Christaya namaha, I bow down to or I honor. When they do it, you can use different names and it makes the same difference. If you are a different faith, you can use another name, but it's basically that I bow down to the Christ in me or the Lord of compassion that is within me. And we just do this a few times and then we can close. Um, it's very simple chant. And I'll sort of ring this bell each time we start. It goes like this. Om Kleen Kristaya Namaha. Om Kleen Kristaya Namaha. Om Kleen Christaya Namaha Oh Clean Christaya Namaha Oh Clean Christaya Namaha Oh Clean Christaya Namaha Oh Christaya Namaha Oh Christaya Namaha Thank you for coming today and may the God of love and peace and joy, the creator of all things, bless you and keep you always. Namaste, everyone. Che and Amen. I'm going to share um, our song, The Forces of Nature, as we close out. Let me know if you can hear everyone. The